at Old Man Eckert's. Philip Eckert lived for many years in an old weather-stained wooden house about three miles from the little town of Marion in Vermont. There must be quite a number of persons living who remember him, not unkindly, I trust, and know something of the story that I am about to tell. Old Man Eckert, as he was always called, was not of a sociable disposition and lived alone. As he was never known to speak of his own affairs, nobody thereabout knew anything of his past, nor of his relatives, if he had any. Without being particularly ungracious or repellent in manner or speech, he managed, somehow, to be immune to impertinent curiosity, yet exempt from the evil repute with which it commonly revenges itself when baffled. So far as I know, Mr. Eckert's renown as a reformed assassin or a retired pirate of the Spanish main had not reached any ear in Marion. He got his living cultivating a small and not very fertile farm. One day he disappeared and a prolonged search by his neighbors failed to turn him up or throw any lights upon his whereabouts or his whyabouts. Nothing indicated preparation to leave. All was as he might have left it to go to the spring for a bucket of water. For a few weeks little else was talked of in that region. Then old man Eckert became a village tale for the ear of the stranger. I do not know what was done regarding his property. The correct legal thing, doubtless. The house was standing, still vacant and conspicuously unfit when I last heard of it some twenty years afterward. Of course, it came to be considered haunted, and the customary tales were told of moving lights, dolorous sounds, and startling apparitions. At one time, about five years after the disappearance, these stories of the supernatural became so rife, or through some attesting circumstances, seemed so important that some of Marion's most serious citizens deemed it well to investigate, and to that end arranged for a night session on the premises. The party to this undertaking were John Holcomb, an apothecary, Wilson Merle, a lawyer, and Andrus C. Palmer. Andrus C. Palmer, the teacher of the public school, all men of consequence and repute. They, they were to meet at Holcomb's house at eight o'clock in the evening of the appointed day and go together to the scene of their vigil, where certain arrangements for their comfort, a provision of fuel and the like, for the season was winter, had been already made. Palmer did not keep the engagement, and after waiting a half hour for him, the others went to the Eckert house without him. They established themselves in the principal room before a glowing fire, and without other light than it gave, awaited events. It had been agreed to speak as little as possible. They did not even renew the exchange of views regarding the defection of Palmer, which had occupied their minds on the way. Probably an hour had passed without incident. When they heard, not without emotion, doubtless, the sound of an opening door in the rear of the house, followed by footfalls in the room adjoining that in which they sat. The watchers rose to their feet, but stood firm, prepared for whatever might ensue. A long silence followed. How long, neither would afterward undertake to say. And then 
the door between the two rooms opened, and a man entered. It was Palmer. He was pale, as if from excitement, as pale as the others felt themselves to be. His manner, too, was singularly distray. He neither responded to their salutations, nor so much as looked at them, but walked slowly across the room in the light of the failing fire, and opening the front door, passed out into the darkness. It seems to have been the first thought of both men that Palmer was suffering from fright, that something seen heard or imagined in the back room, had deprived him of his senses. Acting on the same friendly impulse, both ran after him through the front door. But neither they, nor anyone, ever again saw or heard of Andrus Palmer. This much was ascertained the next morning. During the session of Messrs. Holcomb and Merle, at the haunted house, a new snow had fallen to a depth of several inches upon the old. In this snow, Palmer's trail from his lodging in the village to the back door of the Eckert house was conspicuous. But there it ended. From the front door, nothing led away but the tracks of the two men who swore that he had preceded them. Palmer's disappearance was as complete as that of old man Eckert himself, whom, indeed, the editor of the local paper somewhat graphically accused of having reached out and pulled him in. In the summer of 1896, Mr. William Holt, a wealthy manufacturer of Chicago, was living temporarily in the little town of central New York, the name of which the writer's memory has not retained. Mr. Holt had had trouble with his wife, trouble with his wife from whom he had parted a year before. Whether the trouble was anything more serious than incompatibility of temper, he is probably the only living person that knows. But he is not addicted to the vice of confidences. Yet he has related the incident herein set down to at least one person without exacting a pledge of secrecy. He is now living in Europe. One evening he had left the house of a brother whom he was visiting, for a stroll in the country. It may be assumed, whatever the value of the assumption in connection with what is said to have occurred, it may be assumed that his mind was occupied with reflections on his domestic troubles and the distressing changes that they had wrought in his life. Whatever may have been his thoughts, they so possessed him that he observed neither the lapse of time nor whither his feet were carrying him. He knew only that he had passed far beyond the town limits and was traversing a lonely region by a road that bore no resemblance to the one by which he had left the village. In brief, he was lost. Realizing his mischance, he smiled, Central New York is not a region of perils, nor does one long remain lost in it. He turned about and went back the way that he had come. Before he had gone far, he observed that the landscape was growing more distinct, was brightening. Everything was suffused with a soft red glow in which he saw his shadow projected in the road before him. The moon is rising, he said to himself. Then he remembered that it was about the time of the new moon, and if that tricksy orb was in one of its stages of visibility, it had set long before. 
he stopped and faced about, seeking the source of the rapidly broadening light. As he did so, his shadow turned and lay along the road in front of him as before. The light still came from behind him. That was surprising. He could not understand. Again he turned, and again, facing successively to every point of the horizon. Always the shadow was before, always the light behind, a still and awful red. Holt was astonished. Dumbfounded is the word that he used in telling it, yet seems to have retained a certain intelligent curiosity. To test the intensity of the light, whose nature and cause he could not determine, he took out his watch to see if he could make out the figures on the dial. They were plainly visible, and the hands indicated the hour of eleven o'clock and twenty-five minutes. Eleven o'clock and twenty-five minutes. At that moment, the mysterious illumination suddenly flared to an intense and almost blinding splendor, flushing the entire sky, extinguishing the stars, and throwing the monstrous shadow of himself athwart the landscape. In that unearthly illumination, he saw near him, but apparently in the air, at a considerable elevation, the figure of his wife, clad in her night clothing and holding to her breast the figure of his child. Her eyes were fixed upon his with an expression which he afterwards professed himself unable to name or describe further than that it was not of this life. The flare was momentary, followed by black darkness, in which, however, the apparition still showed white and motionless. Then, by insensible degrees, it faded and vanished, like a bright image on the retina after the closing of the eyes. A peculiar aspect of the apparition, hardly noted at the time, but afterward recalled, was that it showed only the upper half of the woman's figure. Nothing was seen below the waist. The sudden darkness was comparative, not absolute, for gradually all objects of his environment became again visible. In the dawn of the morning, Holt found himself entering the village at a point opposite to that at which he had left it. He soon arrived at the house of his brother, who hardly knew him. He was wild-eyed, haggard, and gray as a rat. Almost incoherently, he related his night's experiences. Uh, go to bed, my poor fellow, said his brother. And, wait, we shall hear more of this. An hour later came the predestined telegram. Holt's dwelling in one of the suburbs of Chicago had been destroyed by fire. Her escape cut off by the flames. His wife had appeared at an upper window, her child in her arms. There she had stood, motionless, apparently dazed. Just as the fireman had arrived with a ladder, the floor had given way, and she was seen no more. The moment of this culminating horror was eleven o'clock and twenty-five minutes standard time. The Spook House On the road leading north from Manchester in eastern Kentucky, to Boonville, twenty miles away, stood, in 1862, a wooden plantation house of a somewhat better quality than most of the dwellings in that region. The house was destroyed by fire in the year following, probably by some stragglers from the retreating column of General George W. Morgan, 
When he was driven from Cumberland Gap to the Ohio River by General Kirby Smith, at the time of its destruction, it had for four or five years been vacant. The fields about it were overgrown with brambles, the fences gone, even the few slave quarters and outhouses generally, fallen partly into ruin by neglect and pillage, for the blacks and poor whites of the vicinity found in the building and fences an abundant supply of fuel, of which they availed themselves without hesitation, openly and by daylight. By daylight, by daylight alone, after nightfall, no human being except passing strangers ever went near the place. It was known as the Spook House, that it was tenanted by evil spirits, visible, audible, and active. No one in all that region doubted any more than he doubted what he was told of Sundays by the traveling preacher. Its owner's opinion of the matter was unknown, for he and his family had disappeared one night and no trace of them had ever been found. They left everything, household goods, clothing, provisions, the horses in the stable, the cows in the fields, the slaves in the quarters, all as it stood. Nothing was missing. Nothing, except a man, a woman, three girls, a boy, and a babe. It was not altogether surprising that a plantation where seven human beings could be simultaneously effaced and nobody the wiser should be under some suspicion. One night in June 1859, two citizens of Frankfurt, Colonel J.C. McArdle, J.C. McArdle, a lawyer, and Judge Myron Vey, Myron Vey of the state militia, were driving from Boonville to Manchester. Their business was so important that they decided to push on, despite the darkness and the mutterings of an approaching storm, which eventually broke upon them just as they arrived opposite the spook house. The lightning was so incessant that they easily found their way through the gateway and into a shed where they hitched and unharnessed their team. They then went to the house, through the rain, and knocked at all the doors without getting any response. Attributing this to the continuous uproar of the thunder, they pushed at one of the doors, which yielded. They entered without further ceremony and closed the door. That instant, they were in darkness and silence. Not a gleam of the lightning's unceasing blaze penetrated the windows or crevices. Not a whisper of the awful tumult without reached them there. It was as if they had suddenly been stricken blind and deaf. And McArdle afterwards said that for a moment he believed himself to have been killed by a stroke of lightning as he crossed the threshold. The rest of this adventure can as well be related in his own words from the Frankfurt Advocate of August the 6th, 1876. When I had somewhat recovered from the dazing effect of the transition from uproar to silence, my first impulse was to reopen the door which I had closed, and from the knob of which I was not conscious of having removed my hand. I felt it distinctly, still in the clasp of my fingers. My notion was to ascertain, by stepping again into the storm, whether I had been deprived of sight and hearing. I turned the doorknob and pulled open the door. It led into another room. This apartment was suffused with a faint greenish light the source of which I could not determine, making everything distinctly visible, though nothing was sharply defined. 
everything I say, but in truth, the only objects within the blank stone walls of that room were human corpses. In number, they were perhaps eight or ten. It may well be understood that I did not truly count them. They were of different ages, or rather sizes, from infancy up, and of both sexes. All were prostrate on the floor, excepting one, apparently a young woman, who sat up, her back supported by an angle of the wall. A babe was held in the arms of another, an older woman. A half-grown lad lay face downward across the legs of a full-bearded man. One or two were nearly naked, and the hand of a young girl held the fragment of a gown which she had torn open at the breast. The bodies were in various stages of decay, all greatly shrunken in face and figure. Some, some were little more than skeletons. While I stood stupefied with horror by this ghastly spectacle, and still holding open the door, by some unaccountable perversity, my attention was diverted from the shocking scene and concerned itself with trifles and details. Perhaps my mind, with an instinct of self-preservation, found relief in matters which would relax its dangerous tension. Among other things, I observed that the door that I was holding open was of heavy iron plates riveted equal distance from one another and from the top and bottom three strong bolts protruded from the beveled edge. I turned the knob and they were retracted flush with the edge, released it and they shot out. It was a spring lock. On the inside there was no knob nor any kind of projection, a smooth surface of iron. While noting these things with an interest and attention, which it now astonishes me to recall, I felt myself thrust aside, and Judge Vey, who, in the intensity of my feelings, I had altogether forgotten, pushed by me into the room. For God's sakes, I cried, do not go in there. Let us get out of this dreadful place. He gave no heed to my entreaties, but, as fearless a gentleman as lived in all the South, walked quickly to the center of the room, knelt beside one of the bodies for a closer examination, and tenderly raised its blackened and shriveled head in his hands. A strong, disagreeable odor came through the doorway, completely overpowering me. My senses reeled. I felt myself falling, and in clutching at the edge of the door for support, pushed it shut with a sharp click. I remember no more. Six weeks later, I recovered my reason in a hotel at Manchester, whither I had been taken by strangers the next day. For all these weeks I had suffered from a nervous fever attended with constant delirium. I had been found lying in the road several miles away from the house, but how I had escaped from it to get there I never knew. On recovery, or as soon as my physicians permitted me to talk, I inquired the fate of Judge Vey, whom to quiet me as I now know, they represented as well and at home. No one believed a word of my story, and, and who can wonder? And who can imagine my grief when, arriving at my home in Frankfurt two months later, I learned that Judge Vey had never been heard of since that night. I then regretted bitterly the pride which, since the first few days, after the recovery of my reason, had forbidden me to repeat my discredited story and insist upon its truth. With all that afterward occurred, the examination of the house, the failure to find any room 
corresponding to that which I have described, the attempt to have me adjudged insane, and my triumph over my accusers, the readers of The Advocate are familiar. After all these years, I am still confident that excavations, which I have neither the legal right to undertake nor the wealth to make, would disclose the secret of the disappearance of my unhappy friend and possibly of the former occupants and owners of the deserted and now destroyed house. I do not despair of yet bringing about such a search, and it is a source of deep grief to me that it has been delayed by the undeserved hostility and unwise incredulity of the family and friends of the late Judge Vey. Colonel McArdle died in Frankfurt on the 13th day of December in the year 1879. The moral of the story? A haunted house, home only to ghosties, will still have locks on all the doors. If this is your first visit to my channel, please consider subscribing. My name is Warren, and I write and tell original ghost stories and original horror stories featuring such cryptids as the Night Floaters, Werewolves, and the Black-Eyed Children. So again, please consider subscribing. Please help me to reach my goal of 2,500 subs in 2022. Till midnight. Cheers! Pictures used in today's video, courtesy of Pix here, that's PX here, while the music is the wonderful Ghost Processional by that wonderful patron of the internet, Kevin McLeod.